Let's talk a little bit about why we have these birds in Southern California. There are about four legends, all of which I have personally heard myself when I moved to California. My favorite theory and the theory that I've heard the most. My fellow sniffers, flighters, and newbies, my name is Marlene McCohen and I want to welcome you to my channel. This right here is Leo and I have another special guest in the room today. Okay, I will continue to scratch your head. So demanding. Our special guest is Blue. Are you jealous? <laughs> <laughs> okay, watch, watch, watch. Oh my God. Blue may or may not make an appearance, but she is right here on top of my light, checking out everything that Leo is doing. So today, as promised, we have a very special subject for you. For those of you who don't have parrots, no need. This is a very interesting subject that if you love information, I think you'll find this to be very interesting. And if you're curious about birds at all, or are just wondering whether or not we have wild parrots in the United States, you have come to the right place today. Now, before we go on, I just wanna cite a resource and really good article for you guys to read, and I'll put the link below, but it's written by Sustainable Sue, and the title of the article is Wild Parrots Multiplying in Southern California. So I am using this article as a resource and guidelines for you guys today is because I think it's written extremely well and extremely concise, and so I think I couldn't do a better job myself, so let's get into it. I promised you guys when you saw my video of me releasing that Amazon back into the wild. For those of you who watched the whole story, there's an entire playlist on me finding the bird. For those of you who did watch the series, I promised you a video on the difference between an invasive parrot or species in the wild and an introductory parrot or species. So getting right into it, let's first discuss what is an introduced species into the wild. An introduced species is a non-native species introduced into to a native environment, either by humans or other means. An invasive species is essentially the same, except it has become detrimental to the local or native environment in some way. There's many different ways that they can do that, either by taking up resources, causing harm, or attacking the native species. As you guys know, I've always been very interested in birds, so much so that I had always been jealous of Australia and other continents and countries that get to watch beautiful flocks of parrots in their wild. I honestly was so jealous, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what, you get to see wild cockatoos? Why doesn't that happen to me? Well, when I moved to California, I was surprised to learn that California had some wild flocks of ringnecks. It was pretty amazing. You could actually see them all over the valley. It wasn't my first time seeing ringnecks in the wild. I had actually went to high school in Israel and the joy of just seeing them fly around was just beautiful to me. And it gave me a view in of how these birds were able to adapt to urban living, which was very interesting to me. So then when I moved to California and found out yet again that the same birds, also the ringnecks, were thriving here. I've also traveled the world and seen the same ringnecks in many other countries, so I found it very fascinating. And then through my studies, I learned that they have notably been able to survive in many urban environments. Naturally, I thought those were the only birds that you could probably find in Southern California. But no, come to find out that in Southern California, we have over 11 species of wild parrots. Now, if you haven't seen the documentary, The Wild Parrots of Telegraph Hill, for those of you who love birds, I think you will thoroughly enjoy that. It's a really, really good documentary. Give that a check out because then you'll get an eye into directly of that wild flock of parrots. So before we get into the conversation of if these birds are invasive to Southern California, 
or considered an introduced species, let's talk a little bit about why we have these birds in Southern California. Now, some of these birds aren't actually too far from California. Some of them are actually from Mexico and other areas, but according to legends and theories in Southern California, these birds did not migrate. And actually in her article, she talks about how parrots are not actually known to do very far migrations at all. There are about four legends, all of which I have personally heard myself when I moved to California, not just about the wild flocks. People just told me all these theories because they heard I love parrots and they wanted to tell me that there's parrots in California flying around. But Sustainable Sue, she writes them out very nice and clearly. So let's go over them. My favorite theory and the theory that I've heard the most, there's, well, there's kind of like three theories that I've heard the most. And there's no good reason for this to be my favorite because the story isn't beautiful by any means. It just kind of always felt like the big story is that Bush Gardens and it was a tourist attraction in the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles, California. And apparently they had to go through a company move. So they tried to relocate all of these birds that they had. I don't know if they were on display or if they collected them or they were just an attraction. So basically when they did their company move, they needed to rehome these parrots. So they looked to local zoos or private homes. But when they couldn't place all of these birds, I mean, guys, it's so hard to just place one. Wow, Leo flew. Amazing. It can be hard to just place one bird. Imagine entire groups of parrots, right? So when they couldn't do that successfully, the legend has it that they let most of them go and fly free. Uh, that's kind of a terrible thing in some way, but it's kind of lent itself to the history of our wild parrots. Because if you probably analyze it, a lot of them probably did not survive. But the fact that a lot of them possibly did is pretty incredible in itself. So another theory, Another theory that I heard so often here is that in Pasadena, there was a nursery and they had tons of birds and there was a fire. And actually in her article, she specifies the name of the nursery, which was Simpson's Garden Town Nursery. And apparently there was a fire and the employee there who had already hurt himself, he didn't want any of the birds to die and didn't want to watch them die. So he let go as many as he could, basically lending itself to the wild flocks of possibly Amazons in Pasadena, which I guess would make sense. Another theory, and this is why I like referring to the article because it specifies dates that for me, this is all tall tales and legends because I'm new to California. Well, I'm not new to California, but I didn't grow up here. So in her article, she says that there were wild bird traders on their way to California. And in the forties and fifties, they would get into accidents. I don't know how often this was possible, but they were wild caught. And then the accidents would obviously lead to the release of all these wild parrots now, which is kind of interesting because if they were wild caught birds, that would completely explain why the birds are able to thrive and live in the wild today. We're talking about wild caught birds so that we have parents that know how to teach the babies and they already know how to forage and so on. So there could be a lot to this theory. The fourth theory and legend that she states here is that in the 80s, when importation of parrots became illegal, a lot of importers, when they didn't want to be caught and maybe they were about to or got some word, they would let the birds loose and therefore also add to the wild flocks of parrots that we see here today. When ecology just want to test whether or not a species is invasive or introductory in both conditions. Obviously the birds, cause we're talking about birds would be non-native because they're not native to California, but still we want to see if they're invasive or not. Right? So there's five things that ecologists check for, and you'll see why this makes complete sense. So the first thing is whether or not the birds are competing for food, water, or nesting sites. Two, carrying avian diseases that could likely spread to other native birds. Three, preying on the local species and decreasing or destroying their populations. 
four, they would be growing rapidly because they have no predators because obviously in their new location, they don't fit into the circle of like life and predatory behavior, right? So then they kind of like become such an abundance that they can just, we'll get into that. Five, preventing native birds from reproducing or possibly destroying their young, therefore acting as a major predator to the life of our native birds. So first let's look at the food aspect. Surprisingly enough, here in Southern California, we have a lot of tropical non-native trees. I don't specifically know if these trees were imported, I guess they would have to be, but basically it turns out that the environment in which a lot of these parrots come from, so do the trees of California, and our native birds do not feed on these trees at all. First of all, it's important to note that a lot of this article is cited with research from somebody named Kimball Garrett who has studied the wild birds and what they eat and how they behave in California. I'd love to do some more research and discover some of those findings. But basically in the wild, the parrots are eating magnolia, figs, dates, olives, pecans, cherries, kumquat, things that our native birds are not eating because they're not parrots. They eat walnut and cedar from the trees and sometimes they even eat bark from some of the trees, even palm nuts and flowers, which is why I kind of want you to go back to this article and see the more specific details on this because it's very interesting. Especially the section where she talks about the findings of Kimball and the eating habits of parrots, which I found fascinating. And just to read one of them for you guys here, it says the yellow-headed parrots only have three types of food they like to eat in the wild, especially cats. Cashews. Wow, how interesting. I would love to know the two types of food besides cashews that they love to eat. I, in all my research, have found a lack of information on specifically what each bird eats in the wild. I know it's out there. My personal opinion opinion is that it's better to always read books than internet. I feel like the internet is more like a recycling of article after article after article. But if you read books, it's people's life work that goes into it. Ornithologists. Sometimes I can find some really good abstracts from some really great journals online, but just one day I would love to travel all over and analyze these birds somewhat like an ornithologist and just really see what they are eating specifically like eating each and every bird. I think it would be fascinating. If you guys live in any local areas, Australia, or you specifically know what you see the birds eating, I'd love to know. When I was in Thailand, I was talking to people about their local mustache parakeets and they were telling me how they love to eat corn, which was so interesting because it was kind of a view in as to why my Picasso loved corn. Let's get to water. Okay, so how do birds in the wild compete for water? And do the parrots prevent access to our native birds water supply. I don't know, let's find out. So where do the parrots get their water? Well, I know where Leo is trying to get his water right now, literally from this water bottle, a whole nother kind of intelligence, right Leo? But in Southern California, the Amazons, and by the way, this is why I chose Leo and her to be in this video because they're both kind of wild in California. Yeah, you want water, okay, okay. So you show them how real parrots drink water, right? Oh, spilling it on me, beautiful Leo. But he got it, he got it, he got it. So they also scoop up water from the telephone wires. I'd like to see that personally. But they like to suck out the juices from nectar, flowers, and tropical fruits. And interestingly, the milk from almonds. I guess they are their own blender, which if anyone could be a blender, it would be this guy with his beak. Which brings us to nests. How do parrots sleep in the wild? Have you guys ever wondered? And do they take up the nests of our native birds? Well, it turns out, no, they do not. They do not build nests the way our native birds do, and they do not kick our woodpeckers out of the holes of the tree. Basically, parrots and their flock will occupy an entire tree and those of them that don't fit will be in a tree nearby which we totally witnessed in my video of releasing the wild amazon they were literally all on one tree and then a few on other trees oh my god i've never i should have brought my long lens 
They nest inside larger holes of tree trunks, telephone poles, which I've seen multiple times, and cliff sides. Man, I'd love to be watching that. So as far as competing for food and water supply, in that area, they do not qualify as invasive. But let's look at other areas and see if they do indeed qualify. The next thing is diseases. Do local parrots carry a lot of diseases? Okay, this one can be very interesting because according to the article and the tests that have been done, these parrots do not carry any diseases. And when they've dropped feathers and they have been checked, they haven't found anything more than mites and such. Although I have heard of a lot of the Amazons having E. coli, which as you guys saw in the video, this wild Amazon did. He had, um, had a problem flying and it hit the window. The reason why he had that problem was because he was already, uh, I guess he got E. coli and he was already off balance because E. coli will do that. And probably now is a good time to explain to you guys something real quick. I know a lot of you were like, but he was so friendly. There's no way that bird was wild. Uh, he was friendly because he was sick. Once that bird recovered, it, it was completely untamed, didn't know how to land on things. The call was a wild bird call. Trust me, guys, I've been working with birds for years. But back to them carrying diseases. Basically, what she states here in the final of this guy is that if the birds would have been carrying something that was detrimental or contagious to the other native birds, then they would have already eradicated complete populations of our native birds and that just hasn't happened. So as far as avian diseases making them invasive, it has been deemed that they do not qualify as invasive. The next thing is preying on our native birds. Do the parrots prey on them? Well, the answer is that because of the abundance of tropical trees, they do not prey on them. Truth be told, I don't know if they would, but it is also discovered through the research that they also did not prey or eat any insects. So when he was doing his research on what the birds do eat, he never found them eating any insects. So therefore, our parrots did not attack our little critter friends that are hanging out. So not only are they not preying on the birds, but they're also not competing for those birds' food because they don't eat the same thing. Which moves us on to the next thing, predators. Do our wild parrots have predators? What an interesting factor in whether the parrots would be considered invasive or not. So what this means is, do the parrots have predators? If they didn't have predators and they couldn't be killed off and they could multiply, 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 then it would completely throw off the ecosystem, right? So we might have too many of one kind of bird and then eventually they may be competing with our native birds for space, area, and food because there's just not enough room because they're able to multiply more than our native birds or more successfully. But it is found, in fact, that our parrots in California do have predators, many types of hawks, as well as squirrels and rats and other rodents that do eat the birds' eggs when they lay them. And not only that, our very own human predators. So when they go and cut down trees, they cut down trees that are holding the parents little eggs and babies so that is actually a threat to the parrots so because of that they haven't been able to multiply by the thousand so therefore in that case they also don't qualify as invasive now let's get on to our last point and check whether in this area the birds are invasive or introductory. Now we are looking at the reproduction of native birds. Do our wild parrots destroy the reproduction of our native birds? Do they go and take over the nest and destroy the eggs? Do they eat the eggs? Do they crack the eggs? What do you guys think? The answer is no. Our native birds are not threatened by parrots who might want to take their nests, eggs, or hatchlings. In fact, our parrots have their own things to do and they're not interested in doing that. No, just kidding. More scientifically said, 
Our parents do not do anything of the sort. Given their lifestyle and the abundance of resources that we have here in California because of the imported trees and tropical plants, our wild parrots have the ability to thrive on their own merit. There you have it, scientifically speaking. When you're talking about invasive versus introductory, ecologists like to look at those five facts. And here in California, they haven't really been qualified as invasive, which I think is very interesting and amazing, especially given that these birds are losing their habitats in so many areas. So for them to be able to thrive here in different parts of California, I think is absolutely incredible and is probably honestly a godsend to these birds. And by the way, it's a beautiful thing to see. If any of you guys are interested, there is many wild flocks all over California. By the way, I can make a video on this if you guys would like so let me know in the comments if you want me to but you should go check out the article and see the 11 species that she has cited are in different parts of California and wear them from interestingly enough in the opening of the article she states that there are so many different thriving flocks in California however none of them are Australian because if any of the Australian birds were able to adapt to our life here they in fact would be invasive so that's very interesting and good to know that that hasn't happened yet because one can ruin it for all right so be responsible with your birds guys and by the way the article closes with this very interesting fact that according to Kimball Garrett they don't qualify as ecologically invasive because check this out they seem to be restricted to urban and suburban habitats I hope this was a very interesting video for you guys if not to learn about invasive versus invasive at least to learn the fact that there are so many different flocks of wild parrots here in California which just proves that this is where I belong I would love to live in Pasadena and wake up to the noise of the birds at 5 a.m. and probably give me a much better schedule I would be very pleased to do so that is it as promised this is that video for you guys I love you guys so much don't forget to subscribe and help spread the word of engage not cage therefore engaging with and not caging your birds I encourage you guys to check out my feathered fun box it's a passion project for me to you basically to be able to share toys that my birds like with your birds but also to put a gift for the parents in there because when I was growing up there was nothing for birds and I just really wanted to grow up and change that not just nothing for birds but nothing for us humans that love birds there's no bird characters all I have when I was a kid was Tweety. Not that that was bad, that was beautiful, but it's what I had. And Tweety was engaged, but also pretty caged. So, if you guys are interested in knowing more about how to help your birds, also check out Marlene's Signature Blend. Marlene's Signature Blend is my choice of pellets with seed and nut mix formulated for your birds. I did this along with Topps Parrot Food. It is organic and all natural. There's no sugars, no peanut smash, and just all around really good for your birds. Now remember guys, if you have tried it or you are trying it, it takes time to get your birds adapted. All right, guys, I love you so much. If you guys are interested in supporting me and my work of bringing these kinds of videos to you, please check out my Patreon, see what you think. You'll have a better direct access to me and I love to get involved with you guys there. Blue, you're so sweet. I wish you would come in the video. I love you guys so much. This has been a very fun video for me. Bye.